My name is John Zapatello. I arrived in Africa as a new second lieutenant. And my first job in Africa, I was assigned to an engineer dump, which was the largest engineer dump in the MBS section. So we always knew when things were going on, whenever they had to start shipping stuff out of our dump. So I remained there, and getting ahead of the story here, they assigned 12 of us to the dump, 12 engineer officers. And of the 12, I was the last one to be relocated. The uh, company commander liked me, and he tried to get me assigned to his company. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. And then my next uh, journey was to being assigned to a railroad battalion in Constantine, Algeria. And I remained there for probably three months when they issued an order that no physically fit man could hold on a base job. So away, away I go back to Oran to be assigned again, this time to Italy at the uh, uh, racetrack Repel Devil in Naples. And from there, I was sent to the 36th Combat Engineer Regiment. And at the first thought of going there, I thought they were part of the 36th Division. I said, oh no, not that outfit. <laughs> and as I was standing there looking at the board of where I'd been assigned, an officer said, Did your name up there? I said, yes. I said, but look at the outfit I got. And he looked at it, and I said, I, and I said to him, the 36th Division. Oh, he said, that's not the 36th Division. Oh, I said, is that right? He said, no, he said, that's a regiment of engineers up on Anzio. Oh, I said, so that's where I'm headed. <laughs> so that was my introduction to the front lines of the war. So I reported in after I got to Anzio, and I found Captain Cook right here. This is Captain Cook. He was a company commander, but he wasn't at the at the post at the moment. So they asked me if I would censor the mail for the, for the boys because it hadn't gone out for a long time. So that was my first job up in the front lines, which I did. I censored the mail while I was waiting for Captain Court to come back and assign me to a position. Well, I didn't get assigned to the position until the next day. And what happened was uh, Lieutenant Cummings was wounded down at a ravine on a 81 millimeter mortars. And I'd had infantry training in the 80th Division and the 26th Yankee Division. And that was my uh, specialty, 81 millimeter mortars. So I fell into place in that particular spot. Except that night was the worst night of my life. I was in a hole in the ravine by myself, usually officers with a medic or the sergeant. And I got the quivering. They started shelling the ravine. It was zeroed in. And I got the quivering, and I swear I came off the ground six feet. I uncontrollably quivering. I was that petrified. So I lived through the night, and <clears throat> next morning I could do anything. I had my baptism. And nothing bothered me after that. Believe me, and I am telling you the truth. I could go anywhere. I wasn't afraid to go anywhere. I was not afraid to take my men and do things. So that was my first experiences in the front lines. And as we went through the war, of course, I had many, many experiences. And probably the one that uh, stands out in my mind and, and a bad memory for me is that after we landed in southern France on Yellow Beach, uh, we had a company commander named Captain Bernie Katzenberg. And he and I <coughs> and two other were uh, given a job of making a survey of the, in the port of Toulon as each company had a section to do. And a particular section that we had was the submarine pans where the uh, German submarines would come in and they would be supplied. Well, to, again, to make a long story short, we ran into a uh, pocket of Germans into a uh, trap, so to speak. And 
uh, we had forewarning that there was something down this road that we were going down because we found a dead silent Senegalese soldier at the corner of a crossroads where we had to make a turn down to go down where we had to go. And as we proceeded down the road, we echeloned ourselves with Captain Katzenberg in, a, in the lead and we had a naval battalion officer who was assigned to the outfit with us. He was next in line and I was the third in line and Willie Cephalus was fourth in line. Well, as we approached an opening in the wall, a uh, driveway, there was a huge house. And Captain Katzenberg says to me, hold it. He says, there's a German here. He's got me covered. Well, in going down along the road, there's many gun in places and underneath this concrete wall that we were going alongside the road. And I would look at underneath the wall. They had a dugout. I would look underneath the wall see what was on the other side. And so I, I kept on doing this until we reached this point. And just before the house, there was one of these uh, hole underneath the walls, which I looked under. And on the other side was a garage, and perpendicular to the wall. So uh, after about what we seemed like five minutes of nothing, just standing there, doing all what's happening, the German has got him covered, I said to uh, Willie, I said, Willie, cover me. I'm going underneath the wall to see if I can get him. And as I went down the wall, uh, underneath the wall, I should say, and down along the garage, back of the garage, I peeked my head around the garage, and as I did, he fired at me, the German, and he missed me. And right then and there, I should have been dead. And right then and there, they killed Captain Casper. They shot him dead. The naval officer, he jumps into a crater in a the road there, and to this day I do not know whatever happened to him. And Safanus and I had to retreat back, way, back down the road to, to uh, protect ourselves. We went into Toulon and reported to the uh, French command who had charge of the port area, told them what happened, and we asked them if they wouldn't give us some help to go back down and try to rescue uh, Captain Katzenberg and the naval officer. And they said, no, uh, nobody's allowed down in there. said, there's a pocket of Germans in that house and they were going to make a push down through there and clean them all. So we had to report back to our battalion headquarters uh, where Colonel Walker, our battalion commander, and John Sonson, our adjutant, were the people at the headquarters but they weren't there when we got back. So when we were at the, uh, the uh, French headquarters telling them what happened to us, they said, they said they picked up a message that they had captured an American colonel. Of course, we didn't know who that would be. So not finding them at battalion headquarters, we went to regimental headquarters and reported in. And they said, well, it won't make any difference because they weren't going to do anything for the Port of Toulon that we were to move on to Marseille. Well, in absence of, the, of our company commander, Katzenberg, which we knew he must have been wounded or something, uh, Willie Cephalus became our company commander and I became the executive of the company. And so he said, John, he said, you take the company to our designated bivouac in Marseille. He said, I'm going back down to see what happened down there with Captain Cato. And next morning I took the company on to Marseille and he went back to the area in which this happened. And what does he see? Colonel Walker coming up the road with all these German prisoners. They signed it, they <coughs> surrendered to Colonel Walker, but they wouldn't surrender to the French because you see the French they knew what they would do to them. They treated them very badly, which they deserved. But that's how it happened, and that was the end of, of what happened. And that's how Captain Katzenberg died. But it was Colonel Walker that they had captured, and Captain Sonnison was a prisoner in that house upstairs, sitting at the top of the stairs. And those two were in there. So that was quite a, quite a thing for us. And I, I have many stories like this to tell. Of course, I'm not going to take all this time now to do it because i got to go up and get my wife. Now, if you've got any questions you want to ask, um, How long were you in the ward from 
what I know from the, where you were. I, I joined in June of 1942 and okay. I got out in uh, January, uh, January what? January of 46. Okay. Oh, you were there for a long time. Oh, yes, yeah. I've done 40 months in a, in a service. And Do you have any uh, specific memories about uh, crossing the Rhine? Uh, no, I had gotten wounded uh, in Epinal, France. Okay, tell us about and, that. And I, <clears throat> well, that, that particular case, I was uh, assigned to uh, H Company because an officer had shot himself in the foot up in the line. Not, uh, and whether it was accidentally or not, I don't know. But anyway, they needed an officer, and uh, Joe Lombard requested my transfer from the 2nd Battalion over to H Company to replace that officer. And I just had a great platoon, I didn't want to leave them. So I asked Colonel Wotner if he would just make a temporary duty for me over there so I could go back to my platoon. And I just got along famously with my platoon, and we respected each other and what we did. And I wanted to go back with them, and that was one reason I went back. Well, they finally got a replacement to come back up and take my place, and I went back to Company E. And of course, where we are, in, in the lines, <laughs> all the time, fighting his infantry. And we just moved into this here bivouac. And this Lieutenant Cephalus, who became my best friend in service. Uh, I hadn't seen him since the time I was transferred over to H Company until I got back. But well, we were just moving into the lines, and I heard he was behind me bringing up supplies. And the position that we were in, we could see the Germans uh, building their fortifications. We were in the woods, and we were doing the same thing, cutting down trees and, and hard to believe that you could do this. There you are, the enemy over there, you're looking at them, you know, and, but this is the way it was. Well, Lieutenant Spalus came up to where our, my position was, and we were talking. Up they opened, in came the shell, and exploded above us, and it got six of us, that shell. So he and I went to the hospital, and we remained there three months in the hospital. We were in Nancy, where the hospital was located. Well, I got wounded uh, about the 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I woke up uh, at uh, 8 o'clock at night, laying on the ground, on a stretcher, next to a German prisoner. Or not prisoner, but he was, yes, he was a prisoner now, a casualty. And then they uh, sent us to the uh, uh, hospital. Well, I'm getting ahead of my story here. Uh, like I said, I woke up at 8 o'clock laying next to this prisoner, and they were taking the worst casualties first into the operating rooms. So I never got into the operating room until 2 o'clock in the morning when I was operating on. From 3 o'clock, I laid on that structure, you know. And uh, so I finally come to the next night. They tried waking me up in the hospital after they'd operated on me, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I never woke up till the next night at 6 o'clock. They tried to slap with my face, whatever, to try to wake me up, and I never come around, just so tired, see, and worn out, and that's where I was at that time of the day, and there was a Red Cross girl there trying to wake me up. And that's when I woke up, 6 o'clock at night that next week. That's another example. Well, to make another long story short, Willie Cephalus and I never knew each other. He was from Toledo, Ohio. I met him on a boat going overseas. And we became, but for 10 days, we did nothing but play cards and whatever you do to uh, while away the time. Anyway, he was one of those 12 who was assigned to the engineer dump and one of the first ones to be assigned out of the dump. And after Going over to Constantine with a railroad outfit and going back over to Italy now, I wind up in the same company with him. We got wounded together, went to the hospital together, came home together, all the way to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, right down here. And he 
he went to Cleveland and I lived this side of Cleveland, so I got off the bus before he did. <laughs> and that's another uh, example of what you could have happened to you over the years, you know. Did you remain in touch? Pardon me? Did you remain in yes, touch? Yes, we remained in touch and I remained in touch with him until about two years ago and I don't know what happened to him. He suddenly quit uh, keeping in contact with me and he wound up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida as, as a uh, financial uh, advisor with uh, Dean Witter and Company. But I do not know to this day if he's died. I can't seem to get any information from anybody. So I have not seen Willie all this year. And coming back to Captain Cook, the last time he was in the unit with me, and I was in, was on the Mussolini Canal, and he had he got hit with a, a ricochet, and he was due to come home on points, which we shoot him out of there fast, out of the Mussolini Canal, and he did go home. And that was the last time I saw Captain Cook until I went to visit him after the war in Schenectady, New York, where he worked for General Electric Company. Now here we are back together again. See? And we have a lot of funny things that can happen to you during your lifetime. Now, I might add that two days before the breakout of Anzio, I took out a 34-man firing patrol. And our mission was to take, each man was assigned so much ammunition, and we had a 60-millimeter uh, mortar, 30 uh, air-cooled machine guns, and every man was given bandoliers of ammunition. And our mission was to go to a particular area and fire all the ammunition to draw fire, to see what was in front of you. Now this is two days before the breakout of Anzio, in which I did, and I, and I went to the particular spot that was designated that I was to go to, and in going there I split my men into two groups. I took one and my platoon sergeant took another. We got over to where we had to go and set up and fired all the ammunition and the idea was to get out of there just as fast as you could because you know it was going to come at you, which we did. He, part of the other part that I had to give to the sergeant. They went one direction, I went another direction, but we met where we were supposed to meet. And on the way back, same way, come back the same way, split, so we wouldn't all be in a group. And I had a uh, situation there where a shell landed right next to Sergeant Ferencheck and I and threw dirt on us, and it didn't explode. Yes, dirt, believe it or not, had dirt from that shell on our clothes. So you, you see, this is the way it is. Uh, another situation I had at Anzio was, I was duty officer one night, and I was making the rounds when they started bombarding us with anti-personnel bombs, what we call AP bombs. They destroyed, they destroyed our kitchen completely. Every pan and whatever we had in the kitchen was destroyed. <coughs> And I was making a uh, check of the uh, area, being duty officer that night, and I came across a hole where uh, one of my men, or two of my men, were in the hole, and it had a direct hit on it. And I hollered for somebody to come and help, and uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Barter. No, that that's something. It was a deep driver. Anyway, he came to help me, and we dug the two boys out of the hole with our helmets. Had nothing else available to us at that particular point. And this is in the dark. We're digging these two men out of the hole. One was killed, one was seriously wounded. So uh, we were given the bronze star for that, being out there while they were gone. See? There are just so many things that you can uh, relate to. And I always had this feeling somebody was always with me. And I, I, 
never have anybody ever change my mind about that. Because I should, should have been dead so many times. I've been in minefields. I went in and got uh, another officer on a minefield. He would, became petrified and wouldn't move. And I went down and got him on the it's on the Mussolini Canal. So we've had our times. And I want to say this. I am so proud of this 36th Combat Engineer Regiment. They are by your deputy. Thank you, John. You're welcome. That was great. Uh, here we go. Uh, Take two. This is up in Alsace at the Siegfried Line. Uh, Lieutenant Sopalis had been out on a task force two nights before to put in a Bailey Bridge. And I was assigned the mission of replacing it with a fixed bridge two days later which meant we had to pull the bridge and build a fixed bridge. And this was right at the Siegfried line. And as we were uh, built, uh, cribbing from both ends of the ravine, pushing rubble into the uh, ravine to cut down on the span of the fixed bridge that we were going to put in, I had my platoon out there working, doing this. At 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, I and three other of my men were assembled, standing with each other. And I was telling them what we were going to do when we came back from lunch. And we were bivouacked in a three-story building, of which we always stayed on the bottom floors, because the shells hit up above on the upper floor. So, <coughs> Also to my left, at the bridge site, I had a British tank sitting there with a treadway bridge on front of it, a mounted bridge that he could lower at any particular spot that he had to use it. And I was telling my men there what we were going to do. I walked approximately 16 feet away from the group after I told them what we were going to do and a shell landed right where we were standing. It killed one of my men. It blew the arms and legs off of my sergeant. My other enlisted man was a corporal, and he was wounded. The, uh, the British officer standing on the tank was wounded. I did not get a scratch. Now, this is unbelievable. So naturally all uh, heck broke loose there. We hollered for the medics, of course, and so on. And our doctor, who was Dr. Kimball, came out and attended to Sergeant Crosby, Kropsky, who was from Buffalo, New York, who had his arms and legs broken off, and he was still living. And naturally he gave him a shot. And I'm not going to say what I've told a lot of people. But anyway, I, I told the, uh, our company commander, who at that time was uh, Captain Lopez, I said, you give me another platoon. I said, I don't want to take my platoon back out to what we went through. I said, I will go with the other platoon, but I don't want to take my, my men out there again for what they saw. So we finished our, our task there. and. Years later, I'm home. Well, Dr. Kim Paul must have had a nervous breakdown, I would say, from what he did here. And I never saw him anymore after that incident. And we came home, and of course I married, had a family, and my son was old enough to go to Kent State University. And he had a lot of allergies, and he went to the infirmary one day and signed in. And a doctor looked at his name, he says, uh, say, he says, uh, do you know what unit your father was in the service? And he said, yes, my son's name is John. And he said, uh, you know what kind of a patch he wears? Yeah, a seahorse patch. Was. And lo and behold, here's Dr. Kimball. 
Dr. Kimball. And I went down to Kent State University twice to visit him. And he was uh, an anesthesiologist at the uh, hospital in Ravenna, Ohio. Can you imagine that? Now you see the small stories that come up? Yeah, another Things one. like this. That, uh, something happens along the line, it always reminds you of something. Oh, yes. Yes. You see things, you, and that's yeah. how you come to remember things. Yeah.